Heavenly Father, we come to you today with open hearts to hear the message that you're going to speak to us through Brian and Peter. We're thankful for this time that you've created this space for all of us to come together and honor you and give you glory. I pray that you'll look over us today to take your words through this call so that we can live into them. And I pray that you'll continue to bless Judith and look over her as she's created this space for us. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 And that was a good prayer considering even the worship song. If you're in Nigeria, please send me high five because I don't know if I just like you or your songs. One of the two, sorry. I can't admit it. Okay, it's okay. I think we like Nigerian worship. Okay, so today Peter is on for two different reasons. So, Peter, where do you want to start from? Well, uh, I'm going to start as far as the uh, Judeo-Christian heritage of the United States, and then we'll move into Chapter 16 after that, okay. if that's fine. Um, Pastor Judith had asked me, in light of our Independence Day last week, one week ago today on July 4th, we celebrated our 248th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence for the United States. And Pastor Judith, recognizing some of the uh, Judeo-Christian heritage of our nation, asked me to share briefly in regard to that, but then also in light of some shifts that have taken place in our country such that currently we really, I'm going to say desperately, need prayers from throughout the world for the United States. There have been some radical shifts over those 248 years. So let me just share briefly again and, and hopefully give you a picture, a framework for what has taken place in the United States, the great beginning, and then some requests for prayer for our nation. And then uh, we'll, we'll have a short prayer time, I believe, and then we're going to go into chapter 16 of conform to his image. So in any event, uh, Dr. Epperson, are you able to put these slides up or is somebody putting these slides up for the Judeo-Christian heritage of the United States? Can you do that, Dr. E? My, my youthful brother does these things so much better than I. Thank you being, for being my youthful brother, <laughs> master and, of technology, et cetera, et cetera. And, and thank you for tolerating your youthful brother, because I, I know... <laughs> You know, you, you have to grow in graciousness and patience with hanging out with me. Let's see if we can get this to work right here. It's great. And Pastor Judith, I do appreciate your uh, interest in being able for us to share this and communicate this. And I think that it can be a blessing to uh, those of you who are in all these different nations uh, and definitely in light of do request your prayers for our, our country. I'm very thankful for what we have, but also very concerned for what's going on. So uh, as I'm opening up, you'll see two pictures there. One is uh, what is called the Liberty Bell here in the United States. And then on the right is a fascist symbol. And I'll explain that a bit, uh, but I want to reference this scripture because we need to understand the spiritual battle taking place that has taken place and continues to take place in the United States and then also in other parts of the world regarding the battle for liberty based upon uh, a higher law, God's law, versus just man's law. And that fascist represents man's law or civil law apart from God's law. So the scripture, Ephesians 6, 12, says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And that Liberty Bell actually was cast prior to the Declaration of Our Independence. Our Declaration of Independence was uh, signed and authorized in 1776. The Liberty Bell was actually cast in Philadelphia, a uh, city here in the United States, prior to that. And it actually has a scripture on that Liberty Bell, Proclaim Liberty, 
throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof out of Leviticus 25, verse 10. That was that Liberty Bell was cast in 1751. Now, again, that fasces on the right, just a brief explanation. It had to do with civil authority, as in Roman law, Roman law way before the United States, uh, but that but is not bound by a higher law. And believe it or not, not a lot of people recognize this. I I could ask Dr. Epperson, but I won't. Well, maybe, I, no, I won't. Uh, there, in the Capitol building of the United States, in the House of Representatives, if you look at the podium and the center of it, if you ever have an opportunity, on either side, there is this symbol of this fascist. Now, in a good sense, it has to do with uh, a variety of things being bound together. You can see the straps around that. And then, the, the, and forget what this is actually the, um, uh, it's not the sword, but the, the, the uh, sharp edge of that is the power of the civil government to come down when necessary. So there's some sort of legitimate reason for it as far as civil government but again remember that is against it does not have anything to do with a higher law and our second our i'm sorry our fourth president of the united states made this particular statement which was somewhat prophetic i believe that there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachment of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpation that was James Madison. And so we have to beware of, of these sort of um, instances of gradual and silent encroachment, which has definitely taken place here in the United States. Next slide, please, Dr. E. So uh, further, a little background, July 4th, 1776 was the Declaration of Independence authorization of that. We declared our independence from Great Britain and it was the first time a nation was conceived based upon an idea, that idea being liberty. And if you look back at that year, 1776, it actually was a tremendous watershed, not just because of our Declaration of Independence here in the United States, but economic things, other things were taking place right around that time period that God had some things in his mind and in light of liberty overall. So again, the United States was based upon an idea uh, and liberty is, as it was fashioned here in the United States, was not to do whatever you pleased, but liberty from government restraints. Not to do whatever you please, but liberty from government restraint, restraints and from tyranny, which was basically the way of life in almost all, throughout the entire world other than here at that time. Liberty versus tyranny. Next slide, please, Dr. E. A couple of things related to the basis of that idea, that liberty, that idea again being liberty. That is the, the reason for the United States formation and declaration of independence from Great Britain. First and foremost, there was an appeal in the declaration to transcendent truth, tr truth that is beyond just here and the laws of nature and of nature's God. And that slide says there, then Dr. E, can you read that slide for us? Uh, the, the bottom portion of it, the, unanim the quotation. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So written right within this declaration is an appeal to transcendent truth again, the laws of nature, and of nature's God. Next slide. And we're going to look a little bit further at the basis of this idea of liberty here as in the United States. Uh, at, 
the declaration goes on and it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, endowed not by the government, but endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable rights are rights that cannot be taken away. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So three great aspects right at the beginning of this Declaration of Independence and the basis of the idea of liberty. Number one, self-evident truths. Number two, that there are we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And it's laid out there, the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then in addition, that it's government's purpose, the purpose of government is not to expand its power, not to become tyrannical, but to secure those unalienable rights. That's why the Declaration of Independence says governments are instituted among men. That's a tremendous document that we have here in the United States. What an, a tremendous, tremendous blessing. Then the next slide, please. So it's called a Declaration of Independence, but in truth, it could also be declared called a Declaration of Dependence. Now, why do I say that? Well, Dr. Epperson, would you read that particular quote on there, please? We therefore... Oh, just just the a second, Dr. Even. Let me interrupt a second. This is at the very end of the Declaration, our Declaration of Independence. So go ahead, Dr. Epperson. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. So just but a second, are, just sure. a second, Dr. Reed. So we were colonies under Britain, but now the Declaration of Independence is declaring that we are no longer going to be colonies of Britain, but independent states of the United States. Go ahead, Dr. Reed. And of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that is free and independent states. They have pull, full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And so, number one, we see in that particular passage there that an appeal to the supreme judge of the world, that would be God, and then a declaration of dependence upon God at the very end. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. What a tremendous blessing that that is in this foundational document of the United States separating us from Great Britain. Now we did, the United States did fight quite a war with Great Britain, which at that time was uh, the greatest power in the world. And it, we needed God's help in that. And thankfully, God did come through. So those are a couple of things about the declaration itself. And then if you go to the next slide, Dr. Epperson, just a little more background here. The Declaration of Independence is what we just looked at. That's the, that gives the foundation and the purpose of the United States government. We went through a short period of time with something called Articles of Confederation as the governing document that, uh, as far as the system that did not really work well. And eventually within uh, seven or eight years, I mean, I'm sorry, 11 mm -hmm. years, uh, the founders came together to see what they should do and came out with a new constitution, which is what we currently have to this day. 
And the con U.S. Constitution gives the political process or the organization of U.S. government to put into practice the foundation and the purpose of the U.S. government. And I just want to mention this book on the left-hand side that says, On Two Wings, Humble Faith and Common Sense at America's Founding. Uh, Michael Novak is a, uh, a believer who wrote this book as well as a couple others in regard to our founding and our, our nation. And he points out that both of those are critical for the foundation of the U.S. Humble faith and common sense or reason. And so it's important to recognize it's not one or the other. Too often from hearing how history is taught here in the United States, nothing is shared about the faith, <laughs> the humble faith. It all has to do with the reason side, but both were important. All right, next uh, slide, please. Another statement by one of our founding fathers who was the second president of the United States, John Adams. And Dr. E, would you read that for us? Our political way of life is by the laws of nature, of nature's God, and of course presupposes the existence of God the moral ruler of the universe and a rule of right and wrong, of just and unjust, binding upon man, preceding all institutions of human society and of government. So, again, one of our founding fathers very much recognizing the importance of God in government. And then the next slide is also a founding father of ours here in the United States, our third president of the United States. And uh, the person that is given credit for that Declaration of Independence as the primary person. And he said, life, liberty, and property do not exist because men have made laws. On the contrary, it was <clears throat> the fact that life, liberty, and property existed beforehand that caused men to make laws in the first place. So again, the importance of things that pre-existed and uh, tying together in light of how then we come up with laws to protect those sorts of things. That, again, was Thomas Jefferson. Now, the next slide <clears throat> has part of what we already mentioned. I mentioned the Declaration of Independence being the foundation and purpose of U.S. government, Constitution coming a, a short time after that, 11, 11 years when it was written, and then it took a couple of years to actually be authorized to be put into practice. 1789 was, I believe, when it uh, became actual law. And that's the political process or organization of U.S. government. And Dr. Epperson will remember, he uh, was the dean of the business school at Oklahoma Wesleyan, where I currently teach. He used to teach. He was one of my professors. And then also he was dean of the business school. And the five core principles of the business school at um, Oklahoma Wesleyan University are on the left-hand slide, part of this slide. Constitutional Republic, federalism, rule of law, free enterprise, and Judeo-Christian values. All of which you can find in that combination of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. For instance, that it is a constitutional republic. There's a written document that tells us how we're supposed to govern. That's the U.S. Constitution. And we are actually a republic where we have represented, we vote in representatives to represent us. It's not a pure democracy where everybody votes on everything, like back in Athens. And it's federalism, where we have a national government that has certain rights and responsibilities, and then state governments and local governments that have most of the responsibilities. The rule of law has to do with how the, the law is set up and that the rule of law is above every person. Every person in the country is supposed to be honor that rule of law. And there's things such as due process, how it is supposed to operate. And then free enterprise, that economically, we have great freedom in order, as far as businesses and conducting ourselves economically. And then finally, Judeo-Christian values. And I just put that on there as some simple uh, identification of some of the principles behind our government so much tied in with those Judeo-Christian values so that, and, and how I'm going to show you in a slide in a minute, how it's the three aspects of political, economic, and moral, which you see in all those five core principles, constitutional republic, federalism, political, rule of law, largely political, but also some economic, a lot of economic aspects, 
free enterprise, economic, Judeo-Christian values, moral. Now, if we could go to the next slide, that shows that interrelationship of in our government and in our country, how it's supposed to be, the political, the economic, and the moral. And that author I pointed out a few minutes ago, Michael Novak, also wrote another book about the spirit of American de uh, democracy. And he points out, he calls it, it's like a three-legged stool where one leg is the political aspect, another leg is the economic aspect, another leg is the moral aspect. You break any one of them or they get, any one of them is broken, then the stool falls over. It's no longer functional. And tragically, that's what we are seeing happening in our nation. So go next uh, slide, please. Again, in the 18th and 19th century American law, it was based on a higher law the higher law being God's law, and that higher law originates outside of man, it precedes man, it is objective, and it is discoverable. And then it, I think if you, I'm hoping if you hit one more button there, yes. And then coming out of that higher law, the way our nation was founded would be man's law, or what is called positive law, and it's determined through discovery and application of those higher law principles. Now, tragically, go to the next slide, please. Tragically, in the 20th century and now in the 21st century, there in the 20th century, there was a tectonic shift in positive or human law away from the higher law. And uh, it had this tectonic shift had its roots in the late 19th century or 1800s, but then into the, the 20th century or 1900s, a huge shift away from uh, the higher law as being the emphasis. And so on the next slide, you'll see we have I have there the higher law at odds with the positive law coming against one another or human law. And again, that idea of the Liberty Bell versus that old Roman fascies where it's civil law apart from that higher law. All right, next slide, please. We just have a few more and I'll be closing out. Uh, and encouraging us to be praying, please, for this, our nation. So in the 21st century, the battleground that is taking place, again, higher law versus positive law. Our nation was founded upon that higher law, but we've moved far away from that. So we have some of the areas that there are battles taking place. Biblical worldview versus humanism. Pro-life versus pro-choice, the battle over life of babies in the womb, religious liberty in churches, government, education, and business, that our First Amendment has to do with religious liberty, a First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution has to do with religious liberty, but that's definitely a battle zone today. Raising of children. Who is responsible for raising our children? The Bible clearly makes that the responsibility of parents. And yet the government continues to take more and more and more authority here in the United States. And then the LGBTQ plus movement, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, queer plus movement, and all of those aspects of that that, that go against the very basic nature of how God made man man and woman, <laughs> and for a divine purpose. So again, Ephesians 6.12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And one, one more slide, and then uh, I'm going to ask as far as some, well, let me see, maybe I have a couple slides here, a couple slides, I'm sorry. Uh, a statement again by Michael Novak, same individual vulgar relativism having to do with like moral issues is an invisible gas deadly that is now polluting every free society on earth it, it this is an in a, an, a he gave a speech uh, as he was accepting a templeton prize for progress in religion in 1994 so that's 30 years ago vulgar relativism is an invisible gas deadly that is now polluting every free society on earth it is a gas that attacks the central nervous system of moral striving. The most perilous threat to the free society today is therefore neither political or economic. It is the poisonous, corrupting culture of relativism. And Dr. Boa has done a great series. Uh, the next slide. Um, 
where he points out, he compares the United States with the ancient Roman Empire in a, a uh, series on the decline of natures, nations, pointing out three different areas of decay, social decay, cultural decay, and moral decay. And under social decay, the crisis of lawlessness, loss of economic discipline, and rising bureaucracy. Then under cultural decay, decline of education, weakening cultural foundations, loss of respect of tra for traditions, rise of materialism, and finally moral decay, the rise of immorality, decay of religious belief, and devaluation of human life. And he points out that he's, he did this series back in the early 2000s, I think 2005 or 2006, had a short discussion with him uh, a couple weeks ago. He's thinking of redoing it, um, but it, we've gone for even further away than we were here in the United States when he did this series almost 20 years ago. We've gone even further away as far as some of these aspects of decay. Now, uh, some aspects of prayer requests. I'm sorry, let me just, this, this prayer on the next slide that you'll be familiar with most likely. Dr. E, would you read that out of 2 Chronicles 7, 13, and 14, please? Sure thing. If I shut the sky so there is no rain, or if I command the grasshopper, grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people and my people who bear my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So some of the things in the next slide that uh, I would personally request that we be praying for that, and that you in other countries would be praying for us, uh, that we can be praying for you and your nations also similarly, uh, repentance and humility. And I deliberately wrote worship full. Uh, technically, the way it's spelled, it would be one word and worship full at one L at the end. But I was intentional. Worship full. We want to be full of worship. Strong, word-fed, spirit-led, Christ-centered servant leadership in the church. As the church goes, so goes the nation. And the church is not a building but a body of believers, like in the first century book of Acts, alive in the 21st century. And then believers living worshipful, word-fed, spirit-led, Christ-centered, servant leader lives in culture, in our churches, in work, home, and society, all those aspects. Our elections here in the United States coming up in November, where we will be electing a, a president as well as a number of other offices, and actually throughout the, the world, my understanding is there are, are more elections, national elections of, of import in this year of 2024 than in a long time. And so elections here in the United States in November, but elections worldwide. And then that God's kingdom come, God's will be done. Now, Dr. E, I need to take a break for a few minutes. Can you, uh, Judith asked if you might be able to lead prayer for a few minutes here. Would you be able to do that? And I'll be back then to start on the other, on chapter Thanks. 16. Yeah. Guys, it, you know, it's thinking about, this is this is proof. And what, what Peter just shared about, about an entire country, an entire system founded originally on God's principles, his his plan, his intentionality. And then as you see, we we walk away, we move away. One of the things that that Jefferson said is he said, in the absence of morality, democracy fails. And here we are. And so guys, I as we we pray really quickly through this and and as we we shift over uh to our content today all that to to remind us is that he is what we need he is our hope he is our truth and the further that very very smart people move away from these fundamentals of of Christ and of God's principles more chaos and, and challenge that we create. We're not that good. And that's this idea that, that we need to see things correctly. So let's pray. Father, I thank you 
I thank you for my brother and sister um, and the, the collection that we have here today. And Lord, I, I pray for America. I pray for this country that you would bring us to repentance. Remind us of our need for you. Lord, I ask for your mercy. I ask that you would ignite the hearts and minds of, of your leaders that are alive and well in this country, Father. And I pray that you would, would not only force an awareness of this, Lord, but you would draw them to a place where they can lead and lead others and lead this country to what you have intended all along. Pray for the leaders. I pray for the people. I pray for the church. Father, I ask that your spirit would fall on this country. I ask that, that you would move on our behalf. And as we begin to look at these elections coming up in November, Father, we pray for your will. We're not smart enough to manage our own lives, to manage our own country. We need you. And so, Father, I ask that, that you would speak. I ask that you would guide. And today, as we dive into to deeper truths about you, Father, I pray that you would just reveal yourself to each and every one of us. And inside, in us, ignite a passion Ignite a greater passion and a hunger for the things that you want and the things that you've called us to do. Lord, you are all we need. Our hearts, our minds are restless until we find rest in you. And so, Father, join us today. I ask that you, you lead and you speak through Peter today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Epperson. And if you could pull up the other set of slides now yeah, as we transition. This is, this is hard, Peter. <laughs> yeah, Peter, can I say something as we give him a chance to transition? Absolutely. The PowerPoint? The, the, as you're sharing, some, is it Psalm 11, 3? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And there is a reason that is a question. It's not a statement. It's not an end. Say, okay, the foundations are destroyed. There is nothing that can be done. But it is a question to us. If the foundations are destroyed, what can we do as a group? Can we pray? Can we do something? about the foundations. First is that you're giving this lecture about what the foundations are supposed to be, what we are dealing with, so we need to pay attention. But I know everyone here, you're all prayerful people. You need to pay attention, because if we are just busy with me and my small kingdom that I'm building, but the whole world is out there and needs our prayers. So the, there is... And, God is raising prayer in different places and for at different levels. But I wanted to ask the class to plug in. This is not just a feeling that we are just telling you good history. We actually mean it. We mean that we need prayer for, for this country. We need you to pay attention to what's happening, not just in Uganda or Kenya or Nigeria, wherever you are, but... America and the UK, they brought us the gospel. Now I know you can say other things came with it, but they brought us the gospel. We owe it to them, as at least Africans, to pray back the gospel to, to most of the places that have lost it. And there's been a, a special conviction that as they brought the gospel, now it's the call for Africans to take it back at least the, 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 the version that should look like, that's not mixed up with all this materialism and everything else that he mentioned. So please, whether you are a family, whether you're an individual, as you pray for yourself, for your church, for the country you are in, 
let's pray for America specifically. So thank you. I thought I would I would put that call out as an intentional call. And someone is saying, yes, we, we will stand to intercede for the U.S. Yes, please. Especially this year. P Peter, just give me one second. And I wanted someone to give a comment. Steve, what do you think? I think you're fine. I agree. I um this how do I say it? Out of alignment society is taking us. And the more we continue to go that far that far, the the harder it's gonna be to to come back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, and I, I think the 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 things that we can all do to 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 discourage that. <laughs> Are, are to live into God's principles every day. You know, I think it's easy to talk about. It's it's another one to say, we, let, let me show you what this looks like in action. Teach people by, the, by, by your actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, Peter, we'll let you go. We know you have a lot to cover. So, <laughs> Well, in some ways, it's a great follow-up because you know, we're in devotional spirituality and we're going to be talking about growing in our love for God. And yes, we want to understand what's going on in culture, but that's not to distract us from our love for God. It's to sort of inspire us, to motivate us, to even want to draw closer to God because it's God who is the solution. And so in any event, let's go to the next slide, Dr. Epperson, and I will kind of move through this, but you have this in chapter 16 of Ken Boa's book, I hope some of you have read the chapter already, and if you haven't, that you go back to read it. You have PDF versions of it. But we'll be looking at God being our highest good. Again, we're in facet six. We're finishing up facet six, devotional spirituality. Today's chapter 16, growing in love with God, and we'll look at God is our highest good, the implications of the incarnation, and hopefully we will have the time then to also uh address cultivating a passion for Christ. But as far as God being our highest good, um, a couple of statements that Dr. Boa makes uh, has to do with it, a keener sense that God alone is our highest good. The, the house we live in, our government, those aren't the highest good, God alone. And he talks about a readiness to renounce anything that competes with the Lord for our greatest affection. I, I'm trusting I'll have a, a few moments to share particularly in my life, where I had to renounce certain things and in order to open my heart, really, to the true God. And then the implications of the incarnation, which we'll get into an in increased appreciation for the implication of the incarnation and a desire to abide in Jesus by drawing our life from his. Those are some of the purposes of what we'll be getting in there. And then cultivating a passion for Christ, a clear sense of what it means to cultivate a passion for him. So um, you, this picture on the side of this slide here, I, hey. some of you who were with us in the past, uh, I used this in another series also. It actually, you can't see it very clearly, but it is right behind me here in my room. My daughter and uh, my son and daughter-in-law, so, daughter-in-law uh, was a former missionary to um, South Sudan. They went there about a year and a half ago, and as they were leaving South Sudan, they had a day in Uganda uh, in the Kampala area. They went out and they found this painting, and they purchased it and brought it to me of Jesus right there. And I love that painting. I love just looking at it and just sort of helping me to grow in my passion for Christ as he's looking up. So as we go ahead, next slide, please, Dr. E. Uh, in light of God is our highest good, Dr. Uh, Boa talks about a couple of things, the school of renunciation and pursuing God's pleasure. Uh, the next slide as he talks, as he moves into some on the school of renunciation, uh, Dr. Epperson, would you read that quote for us? Without renunciation, the gifts of God will take the place of God. And our relationship with him will consist more of wanting things from him rather than wanting him alone. 
Ooh, mm. that is so tempting. That is such a temptation yeah. to want things more from him rather than wanting him alone. And to renounce means to give up, you know, especially a formal announcement or to decide, to decide or declare that one will no longer adhere to a belief or a position to reject. I had to go through that in my life spiritually. Uh, when I first got into the word of God, I learned uh, so many good things, as I've shared in different times with some of you in a ministry I got involved in as far as studying the word of God, prayer, witnessing. But that ministry denied the deity of Christ. And I was in that ministry and in leadership within that ministry for about 15 years. And at one point, I just realized, hey, this is totally wrong. I had a question mark all along in my heart about this denial of the deity of Christ, but I bought into it for a period of time. And then when I realized I need to separate myself, I had to renounce that unbelief related to Jesus Christ. And I actually threw out many books that I had from that ministry because I wanted a total separation from that ungodly belief, that denial of the deity of Christ. And actually it was a denial of the person of the Holy Spirit also. And I'm thankful for having made that renunciation. And as I was thinking about this early this morning, there may be some of you in the audience that need to renounce some of the things in your background in Africa that take place, witchcraft, sorcery, multiple wives, things that are contrary to God's word. And so there are times when we have to renounce things in order to increase our, our expectation, our understanding, and our love for God as being our highest good. He is the highest good. There's nothing else that compares. Next slide. Another uh, quote from A.W. Tozier. I think, Dr. Everson, you know a bit about A.W. Tozier. Would you read this quote from him, please? I've, I've spoke him a couple of times, haven't I? Make me yes. ambitious to please thee, even if as a result I must sink into obscurity and my name be forgotten as a dream. That's good. What a testimony of his heart and the heart that we should have, you know, Make me ambitious to please thee, God, even if, as a result, I must sink into obscurity and my name be forgotten as a dream. I think of our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ sometimes who are imprisoned, are killed, and in one sense, sink into obscurity as far as their earthly existence and be, their name may be forgotten as a dream, but in eternity, God does not forget them. God sees that and honors that and will honor that for all of eternity because God is our highest good. Next slide. And this is in pursuing God's pleasure. I like this. Uh, Dr. E, go ahead and would you read that for us? Please? I was afraid you're going to ask me to read that and I have to pronounce Archimedes. Excellent see? job, sir. Excellent did job. Okay. Yes, the Greek mathematician... Job that guy demonstrated that he could lift the world with a long enough lever supported on a fulcrum that is placed at the right point outside the earth. And so on the right-hand side of that slide, you see the fulcrum is, is sort of that triangle and the point there. And then the lever, or sort of like a, a slide there, on the right side is a load, and then the force coming down and Archimedes said that he could lift the world with a long enough lever supported on a fulcrum that is placed at the right point outside the earth. And you see this picture on the other side, the left side there, with a huge guy pushing down. He's the, that's the force. The earth down at the other end is the load. And Archimedes, that mathematician, demonstrated he could lift the world with a long enough lever or lever supported on a fulcrum that is placed at the right point outside the earth. Now let's go to the next slide. And it says there, just as this Archimedean point cannot be on the earth, so we cannot transcend the world unless the fulcrum of our affection is the I am, the unchanging one who spoke the world into being. And as I just 
thought on those quotes there and, and, and was thinking about these little pictures here. How much better can I see God as the fulcrum in order to make changes in the loads that I carry? And if I transfer that because of God being the fulcrum, then <laughs> those loads can be moved. But if I try to do it on my own, no way. So in any event, I love that uh, illustration that uh, was used there <clears throat> and the importance of God, you know, being where he is, the fulcrum of our affection, of our affection is the I am, the unchanging one who spoke the world into being. And uh, Dr. E, would you read that quote, please? Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him as a guest. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listens, listened to what he said. But Martha was distracted with all the preparations she had to make. So she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work alone? Tell her to help me. Such a sister. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary's chosen the best part, and it's not will not be taken from her. Sorry, Mary was there worshiping Jesus, that one thing that is needed. And I have to bring myself back to that not infrequently. One thing is needed to keep my heart directed to Jesus Christ. And then I can worship. Worship means ascribing worth to. I don't, this was a great illustration of Mary just being there right at his feet. But when I'm working, when I'm doing the work that I'm doing, my heart can be toward God and be ascribing worth to him as I'm doing, whether it's legal work, whatever the type of work I may be doing at a given time. And worshiping him in the midst of my work, not just when I'm at a church service. All right, next slide. Can you go ahead and read that too, Dr. E, please? This is from Dr. Boa. The only path to lasting pleasure is to risk everything on seeking God's pleasure and approval above our own. Only the things we relinquish to him will be ours in the end. I'm going to say that for dramatic effect again, just because it's so good. <laughs> Only the things we relinquish to him will be ours in the end. If we believe that God is our highest good, we can offer this prayer in sincerity and truth. Lord, take away any illusions I may have of becoming great and famous since you are all those things and you alone. I love that at the end. Take away any illusions. And I... Please, those of you who are listening to this, please make this your heart's cry. Lord, take away any illusions I may have of becoming great and famous since you are all those things in you alone. Oh, please, if we in the Christian church could just live that truth, oh, we would make so much more of an impact for God and his kingdom as opposed to just us trying to establish our own kingdoms here on earth. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. We're moving now into the implications of the incarnation, a gospel of God's grace, not our goodness, and abiding in Jesus by drawing our life from his. Thankfully, we have addressed these sorts of truths in the past, but uh, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 has been very dear to me over the past year as uh, several of us in a small group went through the book of Hebrews together, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And it opens up with this, after God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days, he has spoken to us in a son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he created the world. The son, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory and the representation of his essence. And he, Jesus, sustains all things by his powerful word. And so when he had accomplished cleansing for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So many great aspects of what uh, Jesus has done. And 
And as Ken uh, writes in that book, he says, the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, was the most decisive means by which God revealed, and, he, and in this, these scriptures, he revealed his glory, his goodness, his grace, his love, his holiness, his justice, and truth to the world. All of those in Jesus Christ. That's the, the implications of the incarnation, and it's a gospel of God's grace, not our goodness. Next slide, because we, sorry, we just have to keep moving here. And a couple of the statements that Dr. Boa makes, the life of Christ is the unchanging standard by which all other lives must be measured, since his perfect character fully demonstrated the righteousness of God. And we know from Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23, for the payoff of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And just one point that I'll make from a, something else that uh, Ken Boa says in there. And again, I encourage you to go back and read this yourself in the, uh, the book if you have not. But he makes this statement in light of that first quote. All other lives, including those of Moses, Buddha, Confucius, Socrates, Muhammad, and Gandhi, fall abysmally short of Jesus' goodness, holiness, beauty, brilliance, and compassion. In the incarnation of Jesus, God revealed the folly of any religion of merit and human attainment, and all other religions are works-based, not faith and grace-based, as is Christianity. So let's, uh, we could go into more on that, but let's go ahead to the next slide further on the implications of the incarnation. Uh, and Dr. E, would you read those couple of quotes there, please? Naturally, no one wants to die to self. Amen. But losing our lives for Jesus' sake is the currency of, of kingdom living. In case you're not reading this, you all, I, I added that. No one wants to die to self. Any good that takes place in our hearts is an idol if it is not the supreme good, the living God Ooh. himself. Did you read that correctly? Any good, even what seems good in a human standpoint, but if it takes first place in our hearts, it's an idol. If it is not the supreme good, the living God. Next slide. I, I think, Peter, can I say one more thing? I wish, yes, please do. Absolutely. <laughs> Guys, so often the the idols, I believe this, and, and Peter can maybe help me with this, but so many of the idols we pursue is, is really our longing for him. It's the longing of what he can only bring. And, and we were designed to fill those holes. And he's the only one that can do it. But the world offers a very, very paltry substitute. But we don't know any better. And this is why we have to keep studying this. We have to, we have to switch our minds so that we can begin to understand His truth, so it makes sense. Absolutely, yes. Um, I'm just trying to think here if. Um, Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, and we've covered this in other sessions of other classes and such, but so, so important, this truth out of John 15. Uh, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Uh, I, we just had a hurricane pass through our area here in Texas in the last few days. Thankfully, it subsided a bit before it got to where we are, but we had lots of branches down <laughs> and lots of stuff to clean up the last few days. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me encouragement to abide in Christ. Go ahead, Dr. E, would you read the rest of that for us, please? 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, abide in his love. Amen. Uh, and so important for us to abide, to dwell in, to take up residence in Christ through, through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit, and then allow Jesus to live in and through us, as we've discussed at other times. Next slide. Again, we're just trying to have a few to get through here. And um, Ken Boa makes this statement in light of these scriptures. There's a mutual relation between fruit bearing, which is what we desire to do, abiding, abiding in him, obedience, love, and personal knowledge of Jesus. And all these elements reinforce each other. But the heart of devotional spirituality is abiding in Jesus by being in his presence and communing with him in ever increasing ways. I want to just say that I am so thankful this year to have made a focal point uh, to focus on the master, him, Jesus Christ himself, to pursue him. And God has blessed me with a growing sense of him as a person and the blessing to my life. Even looking at this picture of Jesus that I pointed out here on the slide. All right, next slide. We'll try to get through these in the next few moments here, minutes here. Uh, there are, in cultivating a passion for Christ, as Dr. Boa does a great job in his book, identifies certain enemies of spiritual passion, sources of spiritual passion, and then a couple of other things. Uh, but he makes this statement, devotional spirituality is like a delicate grapevine that flourishes only when it is planted in the right soil and carefully cultivated in a good climate. Unless it is nurtured, it will wither through neglect and fail to bear fruit. And so a couple of the enemies, uh, next slide, include unresolved areas of disobedience or complacency and loving truth more than Christ. Um, Ken makes the statement in light of unresolved areas of disobedience and complacency that it is good to invite the Holy Spirit to reveal any barriers to our relationship with God or people that may have been erected by sinful attitudes and actions. And for myself, looking back at my life, I had to, um, I had an area of disobedience with regard to pride relative to my parents many years ago, where I did not go to them to ask their thoughts as far as important decisions in my life. Even though I was an adult at that point, I learned later that there is wisdom in seeking out counsel, even of my parents. And I wish I had done that, but I had pride. And so that's just one area of disobedience that I have seen in my life where I've had to go and uh, resolve that by going to Christ and asking God to reveal a barrier and then to help me to overcome. And it is a blessing, been a blessing to see God do that in a number of different ways. And one other area of an enemy of spiritual passion that I've had to deal with is loving truth more than Christ. Uh, going through that ministry that I mentioned that I was in for about 15 years uh, when I first got into the word of God, some good things in it. It got me into the word of God, but it was loving the truth more than Christ, who is the, tr the person who is the truth. And I had to leave that ministry before I then had my heart open up in a wonderful way. And even those in those of us on this on this Zoom conference 
who may love Christ. You may understand Christ is God. I did not back then. But you may love the truth more than him as a person. And that's the encouragement here to cultivate a passion for him because he is the truth. And then, of course, the word of God also. But the word of God itself does not take the place of the person, Jesus Christ. I hope that is clear. And we can elevate service and ministry above Christ, where we have greater commitment to institutions than to him himself. Again, I've fallen prey to that where, you know, doing, 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 even for a church. <laughs> but rather than making my worship of Christ central and foremost. And so we can have merely a functional relationship. Uh, on the other hand, next slide. Having to do with sources of spiritual passion, growing awareness of God as a person. I just sort of mentioned that and cultivating spiritual affections. I love this scripture out of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. I, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? Just the affection, the passion of the psalmist here. And when I sometimes read that and realize I'm not there, then I can say, God, help me. Help me to be like the deer that pants for the water brooks. So my soul would pant for you, oh God. Help me, God. God loves that plea to help for us to ask him to help us and then the next slide sources of spiritual passion desiring to please god more than impress people again the you know that sort of the battle there of are we really there pleasing god or are we just there for human approval and treasuring god again uh, i'm sorry i don't have a lot of time to go into these as far as what ken covers in his book but if, uh, Dr. E, if you'd read this as the that particular slide there and finishing out with Thomas a. Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, and a light, in light of treasuring our, our treasure of God. Go ahead, please. Sure thing. Oh, my soul above all things and in all things, always rest in the Lord, for he is the eternal rest of the saints. Grant me the most sweet and loving Jesus, to rest in you above every other creature, above all health and beauty, above all glory and honor, above all power and dignity, above all knowledge and precise thoughts, above all wealth and talent, above all joy and exaltation, above all fame and praise, above all sweetness and consolation, above all hope and promise, above all merit and desire, above all gifts and favors you give and shower upon me, above all happiness and joy that the mind can understand and feel, and finally above all angels and archangels, above all the hosts of heaven, above all things visible and invisible, and above all that is not you, my guide, my God. Amen. What a great prayer. Pastor Judith, I apologize for going long and having to rush through some things, and I, I do apologize for that. I'll just turn it over to you at this point. No, Peter, you had a lot to say today, so it's really not your So I hope people can use the PowerPoint to, to do a personal study so that we actually can get the, the gist of what Peter was sharing. And please don't forget to pray for, for the U.S. and your countries. Okay, so quickly next week, because of public demand, we are going back to the marriage discussion for the next two weeks. So be looking out because so many questions and concerns came from last week's discussion. So we've decided let's not just walk over that. So next two weeks in July, we are going to pick up on where we stopped with the with that discussion. So look out. I've invited friends to help us discuss that. I'm hoping I can. Yeah. Had a chat come up. Question of how do we get the slides, I think, is what they're asking. You have to join the class chat room. They are, they are posted in the WhatsApp group. So talk to these. 
whoever that person is. And I'm sorry, I know we have so many visitors. Yeah, that's the bishop from, I think, Nigeria. And we have another bishop from uh, Wukwe. Paul, Bishop Paul, you're welcome. All our visitors, you're welcome. I think we are going to advocate for maybe one hour and 30 minutes because the 15 minutes is not working. But thank you, everyone. Join the class and we can take the discussion from there. Okay, we need to pray. It just come out of hiding. <laughs> and Alex is in hiding today. He's very humble. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. to I don't know what's going on in Canada. Alex, hope you're okay. Ijaz, are you able to pray? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you mm -hmm. for today's class, what we learned about from the Bible, from these teachings should be. We are able to be act and show in our lives. And it is all of us for the Christianity of the Christ's body. We thank you, you brought us together for your glory to be unite and empower our nations in this world in the name of Jesus. Bless our brothers and sisters. I declare and command Yeshua's mighty name. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. Hope you're doing okay, Jazz, in Pakistan over there. So yes. God bless you. God bless you, everybody. Okay, do this. We meet again in the morning. Don't forget prayer meeting. I, I, the Father love. Let it go in the <laughs> Timothy and your father. Please keep it down. But in the morning we are going to be praying. So bring all your prayer requests because I saw prayer requests uh, being shared. Okay, bye. I have to go out. God bless. <laughs>